Norway is one of the countries in the world facing the greatest challenges from quick clay. There have been many large quick clay landslides in Norway. The tragic landslide in Jerdrum, 30th December 2020, had a rupture zone of 240 by 700 meters. The mass flowed two kilometers further downstream. 1.35 million cubic meters of mass collapsed. 1,500 people were evacuated from their homes. 11 lives were lost. It is the most devastating quick clay landslide since the Verdal landslide in 1893. But what exactly is quick clay? Quick clay is clay particles that were originally deposited below sea level. The salt in the seawater created strong bonds between the particles. As a result of the rise of land after the last ice age, marine clays now lie above sea level and the salt has been washed out in places. If such clay is exposed to overload, the structure can collapse and the clay becomes liquid. Yerdrum, 30th December 2020, at 3.56. The landslide has started on the slope above the Tistilbecken stream. The landslide develops further because of high, unstable scarps. The power is cut in the area. The landslide reaches a barn, a garage, and an electricity substation, and develops further north through a forested ravine and a field. Trees and cultivated land slide downstream on top of the collapsed quick clay. The road Fjellina, with water and wastewater pipes below, is destroyed, and the landslide propagates towards Nistulia residential estate. Communication with nearby pumping stations is broken at 3.58. Water pressure in the supply system is lost. At 3.59, the police receive the first emergency call. The police ask NVE for professional assistance at the site to support the emergency work. The landslide occurred in an area where three quick clay hazard zones were already mapped, which became an important basis for the immediate evacuation in the morning hours. An assessment of old and new ground surveys over the following weeks reveal areas without quick clay and which therefore are safe. In the remaining areas, one in 15 gradient lines from slightly below the slope foot are used to assess whether it is safe to move back. Where the line comes out of the quick clay, a one in three line is used up to the surface. The intersection between the line and the terrain indicates the rear limit for how far the landslide can develop. Immediately after the landslide, a 1,230 meter long scarp remained, in some places more than 20 meters high. To ensure the safety of the rescue team, the scarp had to be continuously monitored. In the beginning, helicopters and then drones were used for this purpose. The quick clay debris was liquefied and it was difficult to enter the pit. To search for missing people, floating walkways were constructed from styrofoam boards to enable search by foot. Manual searching eventually became difficult due to frost and winter conditions, and there was a need to use machines. Roads were built that could withstand the weight of heavy equipment. The roads had a layered construction consisting of geotextiles, geogrids, and crushed stone with a grain size adapted to the geogrid. This method of building roads works well in areas where the ground has low bearing capacity. After the emergency phase, NVE started work to secure the landslide area. In order to do this in a safe way, more information about the ground conditions was needed, both inside and outside the landslide pit. Extensive ground surveys were carried out using several drilling rigs and lab analyses. For ground investigations near the scarp, a drilling rig specially built by the Norwegian Public Roads Administration was used. The rig is attached to the arm of a long-reach excavator, which can then stand at a safe distance from the scarp. The emergency road network was used and strengthened to carry out further ground investigations in the pit. 
To clarify the depth to bedrock, seismic surveys were carried out. Cords deployed by drones were used to pull geophones over the landslide area. Both explosives and sledgehammers served as seismic sources for conducting refraction and surface seismic investigations. Due to subsequent landslides, the terrain was constantly changing. Drones were therefore used to regularly update the terrain models. Data from all the surveys were used to build a 3D model showing ground conditions in the landslide area. Early on, a ground-based radar was used to test whether it could provide early warning of subsequent landslides. Such radars are already used by NVE to monitor movements in large unstable rock slopes. The radar was able to record millimetre movements, and experience showed that it could typically capture changes of 5 to 10 millimetres in the hours before a subsequent landslide. This was an important tool to ensure the safety of those working in the landslide pit. The subsequent landslides were typically rotational, ranging from 500 to 50,000 cubic meters in size. They caused changes in a fairly large area of the landslide pit. In one of the areas with the most landslides, the scarp became higher because of rising terrain behind the scarp and because the masses floated out and away into the pit. This meant that the stability of the scarp deteriorated. In order to control the subsequent landslides, it was important to stabilize the scarp. Soil and clay were removed from the top and placed at the bottom of the slope. This made the slope lower and less steep. The work was carried out in a predetermined order to avoid any deterioration of stability. In the first phase, a long-reach excavator was used to dig a ditch parallel to the landslide scarp. This removal of material reduced the weight at the top of the slope so that the machine could be used closer to the scarp in the next phase. Work to remove soil and clay could continue without reducing stability. The most unstable areas were prioritized first. The work was carefully managed and documented with the help of machine control systems and drones. In order to increase the strength of the clay in the most critical areas of the landslide pit, 17,500 prefabricated vertical drains were installed. This helped to remove water from the deeper layers of the debris. Vertical drains are often used in construction projects, but have not been used in this magnitude to stabilize areas with collapsed quick clay. The drains were placed 1.4 meters apart and forced 20 meters into the ground. To install the vertical drains, the heavy rig needed a stable working platform. The platform also helped to drain water safely into the nearest stream. The platform was constructed from layers of geotextile, geogrid and crushed stone. The grain sizes of the stones were adapted to the geogrid. After the drains were installed, a geotextile was laid on top, followed by layers of firm clay and topsoil. The weight of all these layers squeezed the water up through the vertical drains, into the drainage system and to the stream Tistelbecken. To monitor the effect of the vertical drains, pore pressure was continuously measured and CPTU investigations were repeatedly carried out. After installation of the drains, lower pore pressure was measured with a corresponding strengthening of the ground. This was substantiated by significant subsidence in the drained areas, documented by, for example, drone photogrammetry. The vertical drains allowed the landslide area to stabilize much sooner than otherwise would be the case. The water flow of three streams was obstructed by the landslide. In order to manage the water and prevent damage from erosion, it was necessary to re-establish safe watercourses through the landslide debris. Prior to the first flood season, temporary watercourses were opened. The terrain within the pit was shaped so that the water was drained to the new watercourses. Detailed hydrologic calculations were made of expected flood flows, Hydraulic analyses were made to calculate water velocity and depths, 
This was used as a basis for determining the dimensions of the new watercourses, as well as designing erosion protection. The watercourses were built with sufficiently large cross-section to handle the expected flow rate. It was difficult to dig deep into the wet clay in some places. It was therefore necessary to make the watercourses wider instead. To achieve sufficient capacity, long-reach lightweight excavators were required in some areas. To reopen the watercourse that flowed under the road bridge, debris was removed using a long metal beam mounted on an excavator. To prevent surface erosion after the reconstruction work was completed, there was a need for rapid revegetation. Growth experiments were carried out, and good results were obtained with a mixture of local clay, pulverized stone, and cow manure, which was power harrowed 30 centimeters into the ground. Sewage sludge was then spread and worked into the soil before sowing with oat. Part of the forest that was carried down by the landslide has been preserved to protect biodiversity and to re-establish riparian vegetation along the watercourse. The forest also serves as a reminder of the landslide's violent forces. The landslide in Yertrum occurred in a ravine landscape. Ravines are an endangered landform, often with vulnerable habitat types. It is important to protect them. The erosion on which ravines depend can also trigger quick clay landslides. With careful design and restoration of watercourses, the built environment can be made safe, at the same time as the ravine's function and natural vegetation is preserved. The quick clay landslide in Yerdrum demonstrated the need for action to reduce the risk of similar landslides in the future. This has led to increased mapping of quick clay zones and development of new methods. The experiences from Yertrum have emphasized the need to more consistently consider both ground conditions and river hydraulic aspects together. Knowledge of flood dynamics is of great importance in assessing the risk from erosion, including in areas with quick clay. Together with our partners, we worked for three years to secure the landslide area in Yertrum. This film shows some of the work NVE has done in the local community after the tragic landslide, in order to bring safety back to Yertrum. Since Norway is one of the countries in the world with the most serious quick clay challenges, we have developed strong technical expertise. The work to prevent floods and landslides is very demanding, but also involves many interesting professional challenges. There is an ongoing need to train new professionals in subjects such as geology, geotechnical engineering, hydrology, and watercourse hydraulics. NVE has worked with natural hazards and watercourses, hydropower and energy for more than 100 years. We will continue with this important work also into the future.